Yeah. Working from home, but very busy. Uh, okay, let's welcome everybody who is uh, who's just joined us for this. This is the first time we are doing this, so you can see that there's a you know few technical glitches, but I'm sure we'll work this out. Uh, what we thought we'd do is because we know that many of you are stuck at home and uh, you probably have a lot of questions about the whole epidemic and how this relates to obesity. And so uh, uh, we thought it'd be a great idea to have somebody that we can talk to about this issue. And so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sue Pedersen from Calgary to join us. Dr. Sue Pedersen has been a very active member of Obesity Canada for many, many years. Uh, Sue, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me today, Aria. It's always uh, always wonderful to get the chance to uh, talk with you and to share knowledge around obesity. Um, so I'm an endocrinologist in Calgary, I'm very involved with uh, Obesity Canada. Uh, my focus of my practice is in obesity and diabetes. Um, we're working hard on the guidelines right now. I'm involved in a lot of research in the obesity world as well. So how has this uh, COVID epidemic affected your practice? Um, you sorry, just cutting in and out a little. Can you just hold your phone a little closer to sure. your? How has the how has the epidemic affected your practice? What are you doing differently now? Yeah, so uh, the world is changing, isn't it? It's changing every day, and uh, for us in healthcare, it's certainly changed a lot. So, um, in the last uh, week and a half to two weeks, I guess um, we are moving almost entirely to a virtual clinic. So it started with um, phone consultation, trying to um, keep people from having to come in to see us, uh, mostly for uh, their own safety so that they don't have to be out in the community and that they can self-isolate. Um, and also for the protection of um, our, you know, keeping our um, healthcare providers in our office healthy as well. So uh, that's really, um, we've really embraced technology, virtual technology. We're starting to do some uh, video meetings as well. Uh, so I think it's going really well, but um, you know, certainly it's something that we all have to learn and adapt as we go along. And uh, the reason that we're on the call today is really because, uh, I, I mean, the reason we're on the call today is because the COVID epidemic, you know, poses some real issues for, uh, you know, people living with obesity. And so what, what are the, some of those issues that, that people should be concerned about? Yeah, so um, obesity is emerging as one of the risk factors associated with more severe COVID-19 infection. So we know that uh, diabetes, um, heart disease, high blood pressure, older people, these are groups where we understand there is a higher risk for more severe COVID infection. Uh, but obesity is also coming out um, with data in, in, in this regard as well. Um, so we know that this is a group of individuals in whom we really need to um, make sure that we are um, helping and supporting, um, being very sure uh, that um, people are able to self-isolate, practicing good hand hygiene, avoiding travel, uh, and so forth to really try to avoid getting this infection. So those are, those are the general guidelines that I think all of us have to follow. Uh, is there anything particular that, that someone living with obesity needs to be concerned about, something that's really relevant uh, and maybe different for some people, say someone who's got diabetes or someone who has high blood pressure? Um, I, I think at this point in time, it is, it is, um, it's just very early that we are recognizing that obesity is a risk factor for more severe infection. So um, it, there's a number of reasons for that. So uh, one issue is that there can be a lot of uh, lung uh, issues that patients with obesity may have, for example, um, sleep apnea. Uh, so making sure that they're using their sleep apnea treatments, um, having uh, lungs that are uh, smaller and compressed by the larger body size. Um, um, asthma can be worse, so we want to make sure there's good control of that, um, making sure that patients are up to date with their vaccinations as well. Um, people with obesity also have, uh, do have many other risk factors for more severe infection, uh, like high blood pressure, um, diabetes, they may or may not have, of course, uh, but we want to make sure that all of these factors are optimally managed and controlled uh, so that we can um, hopefully decrease the risk of getting more severe infection. So uh, let's talk about sleep apnea for a minute because a lot of people do have sleep apnea. Is there something that, uh, that people with sleep apnea have to do differently? Do they have to be more concerned about getting an infection or uh, you know, is their risk higher yeah. or do they need to yeah. make sure they're using the machine every night? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so we don't have enough data yet to know specifically if obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for more severe infection. Uh, these are still very early days. I'm sure that information is going to be looked at and will, will probably come out as being, I, I suspect, a risk factor for more severe infection. Um, so certainly if you have a CPAP machine at home, making sure that, that you're using it, that you're uh, managing the sleep apnea. Um, but uh, we are still very much in early days. So there's a lot of things that we think will come out as risk factors, uh, things that we also learned, for example, from the uh, 2009 H1N1 pandemic. We saw obesity come out clearly as a risk factor for more severe infection there, and a lot of obesity-related health conditions as well that we've, we've already um, talked about. Uh, is there something that people who, who have diabetes need to be concerned about in terms of it's uh, a great question. blood sugar um, control? Yeah, so a great question. So um, I maybe we could put a reference to my blog. I did a, an article. This is my, my first of my three articles I've done so far about COVID-19 uh, because I do have a, a lot of diabetes patients in my practice as well. Um, good blood sugar control um, is really important. We know that higher blood sugar is a risk factor for infection. Uh, for example, um, people who get COVID-19 can also get a bacterial pneumonia superimposed upon that and clearly higher blood sugar sugars are a risk factor for getting bacterial infection. Um, people who take medications that can cause low blood sugar, so that would be insulin or a group of diabetes medications called sulfonylureas, um, we want to make sure that they have on hand a treatment for a severe low sugar because if a person gets sick and um, doesn't um, adjust their insulin enough, they can get a severe low sugar. Uh, there's a really great new uh, treatment which is a, a nasal puff of a hormone called glucose which can be a life-saving rescue treatment. So we want to make sure that people who take those medications for their diabetes have that nasal glucagon on hand. Um, being in contact with their diabetes educator to um, help them to understand how to adjust their sugars. Sick day management is really important. There's um, uh, several medications that should be held if a person is sick and not able to have good uh, fluid intake. Making sure that vaccinations are up to date as well. So flu vaccine, a pneumococcal vaccine as well. Uh, these are all really important points. Um, so, so let me also, ask you, is, is now yeah. still a good time to uh, get a vaccination if you haven't gotten one yet? And is it still possible? Can you still go to your pharmacist and get a vaccination right now or to your doctor? Uh, certainly still possible to get vaccinations, yes. Um, if uh, a person is actively ill, then, then that might not be a good time to get a vaccination. But uh, in general, if you haven't had your flu vaccine this year, uh, yes, I, it's a good idea to go out and get it, um, unless there's a, a reason not to, which is really if you're sick or if your doctor thinks there's some other reason why you shouldn't. So I have a question here from, uh, from one of the listeners online. And this is a question that if your blood pressure and your and your diabetes is well controlled. And uh, I'm reading here, it actually turns out this is someone who has had bariatric surgery and has actually lost about 180 pounds and is now otherwise healthy. Uh, you know, does this person have to be concerned or uh, what, would you think if the blood pressure is well managed, the diabetes is well managed, then, you know, the risk should not be that high? Yeah. Um, so again, it's it's early days. We don't have enough data uh, that we can uh, that we, the, the data doesn't exist yet where we can say diabetes with good control, diabetes with less good control, blood pressure good control, not good control. We really just know that these medical conditions are associated with more severe infection. Um, I could um, hypothesize that I, I think that if a person has better diabetes control, that uh, this would be a good thing, especially to prevent getting a bacterial infection on top of a COVID-19 infection. Um, high blood pressure, um, you know, it's not, it's not the high blood pressure itself that's uh, necessarily going to be associated with more severe illness, as in where the blood pressure is. It's probably more about the damage that the high blood pressure has done over time. So people with high blood pressure um, may also have um, hardened arteries or they may have an element of heart failure. Um, heart failure means that blood uh, fluid that can be overflowing into the lungs and making the lungs compromised, so harder to deal with a severe uh, lung infection. Um, this is just me hypothesizing though. You know, again, we it's early days. We don't have data on that yet. Okay. So while we're hypothesizing, there's another issue that has come up and that is the the one on the uh, on on the use of ibuprofen 
uh, and, and a lot of people with obesity might be taking ibuprofen for, for chronic pain, for osteoarthritis. What's your advice to your patients? Yeah. Uh, who may be taking ibuprofen in, in light of this epidemic. Yeah, uh, so there was a concern um, a few weeks ago, uh, which I believe it was the French government that uh, came out and said that uh, we should avoid using ibuprofen because it seemed to be associated with worse outcomes in people with COVID infection. But uh, Health Canada actually looked at that uh, and came out with a statement which is readily available on the Health Canada website um, that says that at this time there is no um, evidence to say that it is bad to take ibuprofen if you have a COVID-19 infection. So uh, our Canadian government doesn't believe that this is an issue. Um, I wonder if maybe the question had been raised because if you are an individual that has kidney problems, for example, and you eat a whole bunch of ibuprofen because you're really, really sick, um, that, can, uh, that can adversely affect kidney function and, and could cause the, the kidneys to become a problem. So I, I wonder if maybe there had been cases of that. Um, I, again, I'm just, that's just me hypothesizing, but um, Health Canada has said that that is not known to be a, a concern. There's no evidence that that's a concern at this time. Okay, so, uh, so let's move on to some of the things that, uh, you know, people, not just people living with obesity, but, you know, all of us should be doing in terms of avoiding uh, infections. Uh, so we've heard about the hand washing. Can we talk about that a little bit? You know, what, what, you know, how well does hand washing actually work? Is it better than using it, you know, you know, you know, alcohol or some other kind of disinfectant or are they equally yeah. good? So the, the good news about COVID-19, uh, if there's any good news, the good news is that it is uh, actually quite a fragile virus when you disturb it with some kind of disinfectant type of approach. So hand washing, uh, soap and water for 20 seconds at least. Um, so sing the alphabet, sing happy birthday, you know, do something like that. Um, so it actually becomes 20 seconds is very, very good to kill the virus. Um, using um, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, you know, the pump, alcohol pump stuff it, um, is, is very good as well. Things like Lysol wipes are thought also to be quite effective. Um, so these are all things that we can do to, uh, you know, make sure we're keeping, keeping our hands clean, avoid touching our eyes, our nose, our mouth. Um, human behavior, uh, apparently we touch our faces 20 times an hour on average. I don't think, I'm watching you, Aria. I don't think you've done it yet, but, uh, but we all do it. So we have to be very careful of that. Um, and, uh, and certainly uh, physical isolation is so important. So it was initially called social isolation and uh, the World Health Organization actually changed that to say physical isolation uh, because social isolation doesn't mean we go out in small groups and be social. It means that we are physically at least two meters or six feet apart from each other. And it also shouldn't be interpreted to mean that we should all feel socially isolated. You know, we've got great technologies where we can stay in contact with, with people. Um, a lot of people who um, have obesity, who struggle with weight, already feel very alone and stigmatized in our society. And now having to work extra hard to be isolated and physically isolated um, it can really layer on top of that and make that feeling a lot worse. So we really want to think about people in our life who we can reach out to, who we should reach out to, to give a FaceTime call, to talk to people, to really help them feel that, that we're not alone in all of this. We're actually all together. Speaking of isolation and people being locked up in their homes, uh, you know, you see that there's a lot That's of, uh, there seems to be a lot of concern about uh, actually gaining weight while you're sitting at home, not just because you're not able to exercise, but maybe, you know, there's boredom, there's anxiety, there might be depression, there might be other issues. Uh, any, any advice for people sitting at home concerned about the fact that they might actually end up gaining weight uh, just by sitting at home? Yeah, and it's, it's a great question, and I'm uh, actually writing a blog on it right now, which will go up on my website quite soon. Um, the, the perfect storm of having this very, very serious worldwide health crisis happening that affects all of us, having to physically isolate ourselves, we see less people, we see our nuclear family, and for some of us, we live alone, and there is no one else in our physical environment. Um, coupled with all of the mental strain and anguish and anxiety 
um, not being able to be outside as much as we want to be, the gyms are closed, all of this, it creates a perfect storm of having drivers for greater food intake. To, uh, most of us have an emotional relationship with food, right? We, because we're stressed, we're sad, we're depressed, all of these things are, are happening to a lot of us. Less activity, um, all of these things are drivers. So what can we do? Um, certainly being very mindful um, of what we're doing in terms of our food intake. Um, you know, food journaling, we already know, is a very good tool uh, to help manage weight. I think that's really important during this time as well. Um, I've seen uh, you know, lots of things on social media about people going shopping to look for um, you know, foods that will last a long time and you know, buying things that they haven't bought since they were teenagers, you know, jumbo boxes of cookies and um, you know, high processed, uh, low nutritional value foods that will keep for a long time. Try to focus when you're out there getting things, uh, looking for things with long expiry dates. Try to think about making healthy choices um, and, and bring healthier foods into your home. And being active, um, it, it can be a challenge with the limitations we've talked about, uh, but um, if you're able, it, depending where you are in the world, if you're allowed to be outside, if you're quarantined and not allowed to, have to take that into consideration. But um, I actually saw someone uh, running a full marathon on their deck, you know, not very large deck run back and forth for 42.6 kilometers. So um, there's apps as well that we can use to uh, try to um, be active and stay active. Uh, doing it together as a family at home too is really great. Okay. Uh, now I see that someone has actually asked a question about the topic we've already spoken about, and that is the increased risk in people with uh, uh, obesity. Uh, so the specific question here uh, from Michael is, uh, is there any real data from China, for example, showing that people with larger bodies are in fact at higher risk? Um, so the uh, only study that I'm aware of so far um, is a study of 112 individuals in China who had also had cardiovascular disease, who were admitted to hospital for COVID-19 infection. And uh, they looked at, they used different, they used lower uh, cutoffs for what they define as overweight or obesity in China. So they used a cutoff BMI of 25. And uh, for those people who had a BMI of under, sorry, let me start again. Those who had a BMI of over 25, 45% of those patients died whereas only 3% of the people who had a BMI less than 25 died. Wow. So this is the data. It's, it's, very, it's, uh, it's very sobering um, data. Again, it, it's one study. It's a small study. Um, these were people with cardiovascular disease. So does the same apply for people who, with obesity or uh, who don't have cardiovascular disease? You know, again, we, we don't know the answer. We suspect so. Um, but uh, that, that's the the, the biggest amount, uh, the greatest amount of data that I can quote at this time. Well, but reason enough for all of us to be concerned. So, Sorry, I can't hear you, are you? So, but certainly reason enough for all of us to be concerned, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay, so, uh, I mean, Obesity Canada, of course, is taking this problem very seriously, and we will be launching this series of webinars uh, over the next few days and weeks. Uh, you know, I'll be speaking to some of our colleagues on, on a lot of different issues that we haven't gotten to today. Uh, but I'm sure that there'll be more issues that arise. Uh, how are you staying fit? Uh, well, I have um, the joy of having an indoor bike trainer. That's my number one favorite thing to do. Gets my stress out in the morning. So, uh, and I have a CrossFit exercise that I, uh, it's um, a, a program, a DVD I bought a long time ago that I now I put on a USB. So those are the things that I do. How about you? Well, I try to stay as fit as I can. Sorry, I can't hear you. I try to stay as fit as I can, but I'm not really an exercise kind of guy. So <laughs> I do the best I can. <laughs> uh, well, Great. Sue, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us here. Uh, you mentioned before, I'll mention it again. You do write a blog, uh, Dr. Sue. Uh, .ca. Now there's lots of Dr. Sue's on the internet, but you're the, you're the obesity Dr. Sue. Yeah, .ca, not .com. .ca. So, it's else, doc, yeah. so it's Dr. <laughs> Sue .ca. Uh, of course, you can always turn to Obesity Canada, obesitycanada.ca. Uh, we've just put up a whole page on uh, COVID-19. Uh, there's, a, there's a tip sheet, there's an infographic. And as I said, we'll be continuing the series and uh, hopefully I'll be speaking to a number of our colleagues over the next few days and weeks. Uh, and we hope to bring this information to you. Uh, now, those of you who didn't have a chance to ask questions live uh, or are seeing the recording, 
you know, just send us, uh, you know, send us your requests uh, to Obesity Canada. We'll try to get to them maybe on one of the upcoming phone calls. Uh, all of you, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, stay safe. Um, if you need more information, go to Obesity Canada uh, and we'll talk to you all again soon. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Arya. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. You too.